lot. Um, like Sharon said, I'm Research and Extension Associate at Kentucky State University. You might have seen me talk about pawpaws before. Pawpaw is one of the main crops that we work with, but we also do some other tree fruits and small fruits, persimmons, blackberries, gooseberries, and currants. So today we're going to be talking about gooseberries and currants, which are some unique small fruits that you might want to think about adding to your garden. So gooseberries and currants, they are both um, berry producing shrubs, and they're the same genus. So gooseberries and currants are both Ribes genus, but they're different species. There are different colors of currants. Um, you see currants in this photo on the right two columns. Um, so currants range from red, white, pink, and black currants. Gooseberries in the left um, two columns in those containers um, can be green or yellow or mostly red when they're ripe. Um, some other differences, gooseberry plants have thorns, currants do not. Um, they're both fairly tart. Um, currants especially are fairly tart and mostly used in processing things where you can sweeten them. So making juice and jam and jellies. Um, gooseberries can also be used in that way, but a lot of gooseberries are sweet enough that you can eat them fresh, um, like fresh berries. And there's not a huge amount of gooseberry and currant production in the US. Most of it is in the Northeast and the Pacific Northwest, but most worldwide production is in Europe. Gooseberries and currants are a lot more popular and more common in Europe than they are in the US. So if you're interested in growing gooseberries and currants, um, some things to think about. First, you wanna make sure to choose disease resistant cultivars because there are a few diseases that gooseberries and currants can be susceptible to. You can plant them either in fall or in early spring is fine. And gooseberries and currants both are at least partially self-fertile. So if you only have one bush, you will get some fruit, but you'll get higher yields with cross-pollination if you have more than one plant of different varieties that they can cross-pollinate. So both gooseberries and currants are about three to six feet height and spread, they're small shrubs. Currants, when you plant them, you want spacing about three to four feet apart. Gooseberries about four to five feet apart. And both of these propagate pretty easily via cuttings or tip layering, which is where um, you may have done this with blackberries before. You can bend the cane over like you see in the, the picture below and bury that cane and um, secure it into the ground under the soil and that will produce roots. You can cut it off and propagate a new plant with that method. So gooseberries and currants, um, they're quite cold hardy. So they're hardy um, USDA growing zones three to eight. Here in Kentucky, we're in zone six. So we're um, you know, right in the middle, um, easily grown here, but they can bloom early, which can be a problem. We've seen some late spring freezes and frosts this year and pretty much every year. Um, so that can be an issue. They do like a little bit cooler temperatures. They're actually, um, that's why they're grown more commonly in the Northeast and Pacific Northwest. They don't love the really hot summers that we have. So a North or Northeast facing slope is ideal because it's a little bit cooler, um, which they like a little bit cooler temperatures and being cooler in the spring also helps prevent them from flowering so early and getting killed by spring freezes. And also because um, they don't love the super hot summers here, we're actually doing some research on this right now. Um, part shade is likely beneficial for gooseberries and currants. So morning sun, afternoon shade um, to help protect them from the hottest sun of the summer. In places that are cooler, they would be grown in full sun, but in the south, um, I think some afternoon shade may help a bit. You do want to avoid low-lying areas that are frost pockets when you're choosing your site to plant them at. And also, a lot of these are a little prone to powdery mildew, so you want a site that has good airflow, good air circulation. Gooseberries and currants both like um, a moist but well-drained soil that's high in organic matter, slightly acid to neutral pH. They do well with um, mulching, so wood chip or any other mulch has several benefits. It helps keep the soil cooler to keep the roots cool. It also helps conserve soil moisture and for weed control. 
you do need to irrigate or water these in the summer in Kentucky. Um, fertilization, we used 10, 10, 10 in our goose bearing current trials, but really any balanced fertilizer, any source of nitrogen is good. Um, manure is also a good fertilizer for goose berries and currants, but you don't want to over fertilize because if you get too much green vegetative growth, that can increase your chances of powdery mildew also. So just fertilize at the label rate instead of any extra. So as far as um, taking care of the gooseberry and currant plants, so these are multi-stem shrubs and most of the fruit is produced on two and three year old canes. So you want to prune these to maximize the number of productive canes. So late winter, early spring, the same time you do most of your pruning, um, so anytime late January through March, early March in Kentucky, you want to prune them to remove the oldest canes. So the four and older year old canes that are gonna start being less productive, remove those, um, remove any, any canes that look kind of weak and spindly, branches that are laying on the ground where the fruit's gonna lay on the ground and any areas that are overcrowded, you can kind of thin them out because your goal is for both gooseberries, for gooseberries and red and white currants, you want to have about eight to 10 good bearing canes of that two to three year old range. And then of course, keep some of the one year old canes um, to then in the coming years become your bearing canes. Black currants are a little bit larger and bushier, 10 to 15 of those bearing canes. So you just prune them in spring to, um, to maximize those bearing age canes. So some diseases and insects you might see, and I'll start with white pine blister rust. It's not as common, but it's the most serious and there's kind of a lot of history behind it. Um, back in the early 1900s, white pine blister rust became a pretty serious problem in the US. So this is a rust, it's a fungal disease that requires two hosts. So it requires a ribe species, which is usually black currant and a white pine to complete its life cycle on both hosts. So it became such a problem. And of course, white pine is an important timber crop that's um, in the early 1900s, I think it was 1912, the US federal government actually banned planting and cultivation of currants um, to protect the white pines. So that ban was lifted in 1966 for a few reasons. Um, and most importantly, some cultivars that were resistant or immune to white pine blister rust were developed, but also some research showed that there is a safe distance that you can have between the white pines and the susceptible currents. Um, you want, if you're growing currants, black currants that are not immune or resistant to white pine blister rust, you want them to be at least 1500 feet away from white pines. But really the best strategy is to plant um, cultivars that are resistant or immune to white pine blister rust, which we'll go through cultivars in a minute, but um, Consort, Coronet, Crusader, Ben Sarek, and Titania are all immune or resistant to white pine blister rust. So that there are actually more gooseberries and currants grown in the US in the 1800s. People brought them over from Europe and they were a little more popular in the 1800s. And then there is this ban that's um, kind of put a stop to that industry and they haven't really come back since the ban was lifted in 1966 and the, um, the immune and resistant cultivars were developed. But you can see in the photos what that rust looks like on gooseberries and currants and then also on, on the white pine. So some other things that you may see more commonly but it's not as serious a problem is um, also fungal diseases, powdery mildew, septoria leaf spot and anthracnose. So for all of these, they're all fungal diseases. So it's easier or better to prevent them and try to keep disease from being a problem and happening that is to try to fix the problem once you have it, like pretty much everything else. So prevention of these fungal diseases, you want to make sure you have good airflow, good air circulation. So choosing a site that has good airflow not spacing your plants too close together, pruning them so they're not too, too overcrowded and too dense, 
And you also want to avoid overhead irrigation or if you're watering by hand, you know, spraying them so that you have a lot of leaf wetness. Um, so use drip irrigation or if you're watering with a hose, just water more at the surface because leaf wetness is what causes these fungal diseases to proliferate more. Also good sanitation. If you have diseased leaves that have fallen on the ground, you want to clean those up and remove them. And choosing resistant cultivars is really the best way to avoid these diseases. If you do get them, um, powdery mildew responds best to sulfur-based fungicides and gooseberries and currants. And septoria leaf spot and anthracnose are more responsive to copper-based fungicides with um, ribes species. And you do see powdery mildew more commonly on currants than on gooseberries. And then the reverse, you see more septoria leaf spot on gooseberries than you do in, on currants and anthracnose. So the photos, the top photo is powdery mildew on a currant, and the bottom photo is septoria leaf spot on a gooseberry. And anthracnose looks pretty similar to septoria leaf spot. Oops. So as far as insect pests, um, there are not a lot of insects that bother gooseberries and currants. Um, there is a gooseberry and currant fruit worm that will get into the fruit. And the main way to avoid this is you just want to harvest the fruit promptly. You don't want to leave fruit on the bushes getting overripe or fruit on the ground that are rotting. These are um, a moth, so Bt will work um, to control these. Gooseberry softfly. Um, you see in the second photo, the larva of this feeds on the leaves. Um, this usually isn't a huge problem, but there is a nematode that works against that for biological control. And I'm sure you've all heard about spotted wing drosophila. That's a pretty big problem now in a lot of small fruits. Luckily with gooseberries and currants, the harvest is in June and July, and that's usually early enough to avoid spotted wing drosophila um, because that's worse in late summer. So Spotted wing drosophila is not a big problem with gooseberries and currants. Birds are probably the biggest pest because like pretty much any berry, especially red and purple and black berries, um, birds, especially robins, really like them. So like anything, it's kind of hard to keep them off. Netting is the best way. And, you know, there's the bird alarms and bird scares that look like a hawk or owl or just the aluminum pythons tied outside that help a little bit until the birds get used to it and know that it's not going to hurt them and then they start to ignore it. So netting is really the best way to keep the birds off of the bushes. <clears throat> so some cultivars that we recommend for Kentucky. We um, have had some variety trials of both gooseberries and currants at KSU. So this is based on results from our variety trials here in Frankfort, Kentucky. Um, so these are some varieties that will do well in Kentucky that we recommend. Titania is a black currant. It is immune to white pine blister rust and it's resistant to powdery mildew. So those are, are both very important. It's got good large fruit, good quality fruit, high yields. Um, ben Sarek also is disease resistant, high yielding, good fruit quality. Ben Sarek is a little bit more, a smaller, more compact bush, about three to four feet tall, as opposed to the others will be a little larger, but not, not huge, more in the four to six foot tall range. So some other black currents that we do not recommend as highly based on our trials and other information. Um, ben Lamond is a good variety. It's actually what they use most commonly for commercial juice production, but it's susceptible to white pine blister rust. So it did well in our trials, but you only want to grow this if you don't have any white pines nearby since it's not resistant to white pine blister rust. Um, Consort and Crusader did not do well in our trials. The fruit quality was not good and the yields were low. And um, they are also a little bit more disease susceptible to disease to powdery mildew at least. So those consort and cr crusader we do not recommend for Kentucky. Crandall is a little bit different. This is a clove current. This is a different species. So again, the same genus ribes, but a different species. Um, it looks like a black current, but the flavor is pretty different. And um, this is native to the U.S. and um, it has 
nice, pretty, fragrant spring um, flowers, yellow flowers in the spring. The flavor is different. So it's a little bit sweeter and milder than the other black currants, but it's a different flavor. So it's, it's kind of like growing a different fruit, basically. If you were wanting to grow black currants, this one tastes completely different than the other black currants. If you're making, you know, find a black currant jelly recipe, then this would be kind of a different flavor. It has kind of a sweet, spicy flavor. But being native to the US, this does really well. It's tolerant of our hot summers. We were talking about the other gooseberries and currants don't like the heat in the summer. So this is disease resistant, does well in the heat and humidity in the summers. And this also performed well in the trial. So it's a good quality fruit, but just know that it's kind of a different flavor from the other black currants. So these are some of the results from our trial. And you can see that um, Crandall, Ben Sarek, and Ben Lamond all performed well in our trials as far as the yield, um, berry weight, um, and disease resistance with the exception of um, Ben Lamond is um, susceptible to white pine blister rust. So keep that in mind. Titania actually um, has been found to do well in Kentucky, but it was not in this trial. So we hadn't, it's not in the table and hadn't mentioned it. But Titania is an excellent cultivar that's also recommended for Kentucky. So really Titania and Bensaric are the best two true black currants and then Crandall for the clove currant. There's some others, other new cultivars. This Minaj Muriel is a new cultivar um, that came out after we had our trial that is disease resistant and heat tolerant that um, we would like to try in the future in trials. So moving on to white currants, um, here are some that we had in our trial and some others that, that perform well that were not in our trials. Um, Primus is disease resistant. The yields were not super high. Yields tend to not be as high on the white and red currants as they are on the black currants. Um, white Imperial is a little bit more disease resistant. Um, Blanca was not in our trial, but it does perform well in Kentucky. It's, it has high yielding, pretty vigorous plants, um, fairly disease resistant. Pink Champagne is a really unique um, pink colored berry. It did have lower yields and some powdery mildew problems, but it has a really pretty kind of translucent pink color. Red currants, some that we had in our trials that did well at KSU were Young Here Van Tet and Red Start, and both of those are disease resistant and high yielding. Ravada again, wasn't in our trial, but based on other data, it is a good red currant cultivar, has um, disease resistance, large fruit. It's a little bit later blooming, so that can help with spring frosts and freezes. Uh, we had Red Lake and Viking that um, were fairly productive, but they were a little bit more susceptible to disease. So this shows our red and white currants. Um, and again, you're looking at harvest in June for these. Um, mid-June, sometimes into July. And all of them performed fairly well, but um, Red Lake, again, is susceptible to diseases to powdery mildew and white pine blister rust, both. And Blanca, which is not in the table, also performs well in Kentucky. So gooseberries, which again are the same, same genus, but a different species. So they look quite a bit different than currants, even though they're the same genus. Um, these are some gooseberries that we recommend for Kentucky. Kinnamaki Red um, was probably my favorite. It has a really nice kind of tart raspberry flavor and somewhat crunchy texture. So gooseberries look a little bit like grapes, except they're not in bunches, they're single fruit. Um, they're kind of like a firmer grape texture wise. So this had kind of a firm, almost crisp texture. And this again, kind of a tart raspberry like flavor. Um, disease resistant. Amish red also has good flavor, disease resistance. <clears throat> Poor man um, did fairly well in our trials, except for not being as resistant to anthracnose and septoria leaf spot. And these are all red when ripe, or some of them kind of have a blush. They'll be a little bit yellow with a red blush, but they're mostly red when ripe. 
But some other gooseberries that were in our trial that did not perform as well that I wouldn't recommend. Pixwell, which gets its name because the berries hang down a little bit. Um, remember, gooseberries are thorny. So these have a longer stem and hang down to be easier to pick. So that's why they get the name Pixwell. Um, but unfortunately, the flavor was not good, the texture. It kind of had a mushy, mealy texture and just not a lot of flavor. Um, Invicta just had poor survival, um, didn't do very well here. And uh, Jan's Prairie and Captivator both were susceptible to disease. So these we would not recommend. These are some newer gooseberry varieties that were not in our trial, but if we do a trial in the future, I would like to try these, or if you're just planting a couple of plants in your backyard, might be worth trying. Tixia has these kind of oval elongated fruit that also is almost thornless. The thorns are soft and the younger shoots ha don't have very many thorns. Glendale is supposed to be more tolerant of the heat and humidity that we get in the summers here. Um, Jean is resistant to powdery mildew. And then some others that just kind of have unique characteristics, colors, so black velvet and red George are both dark purple, almost black. A jewel is kind of a peach colored berry and friend is the new thornless gooseberry. So that will certainly help with harvest when it's thornless. So these are some that we would like to try in future trials, but we don't have data on right now. So looking at the data that was in our trial, again, Amish red and Hinamaki red performed the best. Um, they had the highest yields and best quality berries and disease resistance. Poor man, again, performed pretty well. That would probably be, be the third choice, but it was not quite as disease resistant. And if you're interested in growing gooseberries and currants, they're not super common. So local garden centers probably will not have them. There might be some chance that, that a local garden center would have them, but they're not as common as being able to go and buy blackberry and raspberry bushes. So these are some nurseries that sell gooseberries and currants. Um, Indiana Berry and Plant Company, Bramble Berry Farm, and Stark Brothers Nursery are right, the closest in this area, but all of these are mail order companies, so they don't don't need to be local somewhere that you drive to um, to get them. So when you're growing gooseberries and currants, um, they both take about four years to get to full production. You usually get a few berries the second year after planting, and then more by year three, and then year four will be in full mature production. And gooseberries are slightly higher yielding. So for gooseberries, you're looking at about four to five quarts of berries per bush. That's eight to 10 pounds per plant. And currants about three to four quarts of berries per bush, <clears throat> excuse me, or five to eight pounds per plant. So again, this is an early summer crop. So they ripen over about a month long period in June through July. And they will um, change color when they're ripe. So that's, that's how you know that they're ripe. Gooseberries, again, are on an individual stem. Currants are in bunches, kind of like small grapes, miniature grape bunches. And um, hand harvesting, they can stay on the vine a little bit longer or on the bush a little bit longer than some berries. So you can harvest weekly if you want to. You don't have to get out there every day to pick the fruit. If you're looking to sell these, the average price, um, retail price that you get is $3.50 a pound or five to six dollars per quart. And it's usually, you know, kind of a small scale farmer's market or specialty market type crop. They are very nutritious, um, especially black currants are high in vitamin C. They have quite a bit more vitamin C than oranges even. But gooseberries and currants both, they're high in vitamin A, high in antioxidants and anthocyanins. So what can you do with the fruit? Um, first, when you harvest the fruit, you want to refrigerate it quickly so it'll store a little bit longer. You can, if you leave them at room temperature, if you're going to eat them or use them right away, you can leave them at room temperature, but get them a refrigeration to store them for a few days or a um, couple of weeks or for longer term storage over a week or two, you can freeze the whole berries. Currants are more tart and astringent than gooseberries. So 
they're pretty much always used in some type of processing or something where you add sugar to them. So jelly, juice, um, liqueur, things like that. Gooseberries are a little bit sweeter, so you can eat gooseberries fresh, but they're also often used in jam and wine and things like that, or in baked goods. Um, you may have heard of gooseberry pie. That's probably what I was most common with, uh, most familiar with. And something that I just thought was interesting is um, we were talking about black currants being more popular in Europe than they are here. So purple Skittles in Europe are actually black currant flavored rather than grape. So that just kind of goes to show how much more common and more popular currants are there than they are here in the US. So in summary, um, you know, gooseberries and currants, they're a pretty somewhat unusual, uncommon fruit, but they do have potential both as part of your backyard fruit production, backyard garden, or for small scale commercial production for farmers markets and specialty markets. But we would like to do more research on especially the newer cultivars and some different growing methods, like if shade is beneficial for them. Because besides the diseases, um, the heat in the summer and they wanna lose their leaves in the heat in the summer sometimes was the biggest problem that we had. So the cultivar recommendations for black currant, Titania and Bensaric and Ben Lamond, only if you don't have white pines, red currant, the Red Start, Young Kirvantet, and Ravada, white currant, Primus, White Imperial, and Blanca, and gooseberries, the Hinamaki Red, Amish Red, and Foreman, all did the best based on our trials at KSU.